I hope that looks okay to you. Let's see. Um, okay. Um, like I said in the email, um, please let me know in the chat if you have any questions or issues. Um, I'm not going to be able to look at it every second. It's one of the disadvantages of doing this online, but I'm going to certainly check it at least halfway through and try to answer any questions at that point. Um, so I'll just get going. And in terms of my background, um, I was a math major in college, and then I went and got a PhD in mathematical biology. I've been working in the field of environmental education for about four years now. So this kind of combines all my loves being mathemat mathematics, biology, teaching people about nature. Um, it's one of the topics near and dear to my heart. So I'm really happy to be here with you all tonight. Um, and I just love this picture of these butterflies who are doing some math together. Um, okay, there we go. Um, so there are lots and lots of different patterns out there in nature. It can be as simple as the white and black pattern on a raccoon scale. This was actually taken on our beaver pond a few weeks ago. Um, there are beautiful shapes like in the um, diatoms up in the right hand corner. That's something you might see if you had a microscope out in Chesapeake Bay. Um, there are beautiful spirals like this snail that was also taken here at the Clifton Institute. I love this picture of the leaf. I took this one up in British Columbia and you can just see this amazing maze pattern where a little leaf miner or some kind of little bug was chewing its way through the leaf and made this amazing pattern. They're all over nature, all sorts of different patterns and shapes and things to look at mathematically. Um, a very popular um, type of pattern to talk about in nature are fractals, um, which is just a pattern that looks similar no matter at what scale you're looking at. So something like this tree looks all very tangly and twisty and uh, curly. And then if you zoom in on the top part of the tree, it looks just as twisty and curly as it did was when you were looking at the whole tree. Um, similarly with the fern, um, you can see that the shapes of the leaflets kind of replicate themselves at various different scales. So people love talking about fractals in nature. Um, and there are all sorts of different patterns that I could be talking about. Um, but this evening, I'm going to be focusing on my two favorite patterns, which are hexagons and Fibonacci numbers. Um, so for each of those two types of patterns, um, I'm going to describe the pattern, walk through a mathematical explanation for why the pattern is the way it is, and then show hopefully a couple ways that you can play with the pattern and study it yourself. Sorry, I'm going to change my view here. Um, I'm blocking myself. There we go, that's a little better. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so to start with, hexagons. This is just, I think, an amazing picture of the hexagons that can be found in a honeybee hive. They make just perfect, beautiful hexagons repeating over and over and over again in this beautiful sequential pattern. Um, but honeybees, of course, are not the only animal that makes beautiful hexagons in their nests or in their hives. So again, you can have honeybees making these hexagons to store their honey or their eggs in. Um, Bald-faced hornets also use hexagons in their nests, as do paper wasps. And that picture um, in the kind of a tan roof line, I think is also just a stunning example of how exact and precise these, these animals can build hexagons. Um, and, and yellow jackets, and there are all sorts of other species of bees and wasps and hornets that use hexagons, a repeating pattern of hexagons in their nests or in their hives. Um, so if we look at the whole evolutionary tree of uh, invertebrates, all of those animals are in the order here, Hymenoptera. And maybe it's just the fact, maybe it's just the case rather that bees and wasps really like hexagons. They just at some point in their evolutionary history decided they like hexagons and they've used it ever since. Um, but of course, there's something more interesting going on. So to make their nests, um, beeswax and paper wasps do something a little bit different. So bees have to consume a lot of sugar and they turn it into the wax that they use to build those hexagons. Um, and wasps and hornets have to go out and find wood and chew it and then turn it into paper to build their nests. But either way, it's a really expensive process that you have to consume a lot of energy, consume a lot of resources, spend a lot of time building these structures. They're not cheap to construct, 
So if they were smart, they would have figured out what the cheapest way is to store their eggs using these really time intensive, resource intensive materials. So the question is, what is that cheapest way to store their eggs in nests? So I'm going to walk through a few bad strategies before we finally, sorry, there's a lamp too, um, before we finally converge on the best strategy. You could imagine a, a nest of bees or wasps, and maybe every individual in the nest has a different favorite shape. Maybe some of them like triangles, or some of them like pentagons, or some of them like octagons, and as they're building their nest, they're just going to use whatever shape they feel like uh, to store their eggs in. The problem is all the eggs are the same size. So if you try to actually put eggs into this hypothetical nest, they're going to fit just fine in some of the shapes, not in some, not in other of the shapes, and then they're going to be all sorts of gaps left over. So it's a waste of the material. It's a waste of space. Not a good way to store your eggs. So having everybody have a different shape is not a good strategy. And similarly, if you make the eggs small enough to fit in each of the shapes, then you're still wasting a lot of space and material. So maybe all of the members of the nest should be using the same shape. And maybe they chose pentagons. And maybe they chose pentagons that were not exactly regular. All the sides are not the same. All the angles are not the same. But they can pack them in nicely. And if we try to put eggs in these irregular pentagons, they fit just fine. But you can see there's a lot of wasted space around the edges because they're a little wider than they are tall. So again, they're wasting a lot of space. They're wasting wax or paper having to build these cells that don't fit this, the, um, the eggs very neatly. OK, so that's another bad strategy. What if we say that the insects have figured out they have to use shapes that have the same sides and the same angles all around? So maybe they've decided to use regular pentagons that have all the same sides and all the same angles. The problem here is that you can't pack regular uh, pentagons into a nicely repeating pattern without any gaps. So if we try to put the eggs in there, you can see that there are, shape, there are holes, there are gaps in there where pentagons didn't fit. And again, that's a waste of space and materials, so it's not the best strategy for these insects to be using. Um, so we've figured out so far three core strategies, which are for the insects to use all different shapes, for them to use irregular shapes, or for them to use regular shapes that don't tile without any gaps. So what we're looking for is an equilateral shape that can be tiled repeatedly without any gaps. And it turns out that there are only three candidate shapes, the triangle, the equilateral triangle, the square, and the equilateral hexagon. So you can see they pack and uh, tile nicely into these repeating patterns, triangles, squares, and hexagons. And the reason that these three shapes can be tiled that way is that their interior angles add up to 360 degrees. So for instance, with the triangles, each corner of the triangle is 60 degrees. So you can have six of them all meet at an intersection because those six corners add up to uh, 360 degrees. Similarly with the squares, the corners of the squares are 90 degrees. So you can fit four of them at an intersection because those four 90 degree ang angles add up to 360 degrees. And same with the hexagons. This time you can fit three corners of the hexagons at a single intersection because each of the angles is 120 degrees. And it turns out that these are the only three polygons that you can do this with because these are the only three polygons that have interior angles that evenly divide 360 degrees. So if you try to do it with a pentagon, that interior angle is 108 degrees. So you can fit three of them at that intersection that I highlighted with the red circle, but then there's a little bit left over that can't, where a pentagon can't fit in. So of all the possible shapes, you can have eight-sided polygons, 10-sided polygons, a million-sided polygons. These are our only three options. So now we have to determine which of these three is best for storing your eggs in. So to do that, we have to do a little trigonometry. And we're going to assume that the egg is of a certain diameter. And in the case of the triangle, you can figure out that the side must be the square root of the 3 times diameter of the egg. And I can show all that to you later if you'd like. Um, so when you add up the three sides of the triangle, 
the perimeter, that is the amount of either wax or paper that you would have to um, build with to construct the triangle is three times the square root of three times the width or the diameter of the egg that you're trying to store. In the case of the square, the perimeter, so again, the amount of wax or paper that you're gonna to have to use is four times the diameter. And in the case of the hexagon, the perimeter is six divided by the square root of three times the diameter of the egg. So the certain size of the egg that you're trying to store. Um, I don't know about you, I'm not very comfortable with the square root of three. Um, so I'm gonna round these things off to just the nearest 10th. So the triangle, the perimeter of the triangle is about 5.2 times the diameter of the egg. The perimeter of the square is exactly four times the diameter of the egg. And the perimeter of the hexagon is about 3.5 times the diameter of the egg. So here's our answer. If we have a certain size egg that we're trying to store in the nest, using hexagons, we can use the least amount of either wax or paper to pack all those eggs in. You might notice in these pictures that there's a lot of overlap between adjacent cells. So maybe if you, you don't, you don't actually have to build each of those walls twice because once you've already built it for the neighboring cell, you can just add on to it. But even if you take that into consideration, things still work out in, the, in favor of hexagons. So if you add up all of the sides in the three tiling patterns that store six eggs, you can still see that the hexagons use the least amount of materials to pack those six eggs in. So just to summarize, hexagons are the best of all possible shapes because they can use the least material to store their eggs. So the flip side of that statement is that hexagons are the best because they can store the most amount of stuff using a given amount of material. And this is actually an activity that we do on some of our field trips. And I made a video about this a couple weeks ago for um, our YouTube channel, which you can find online. And it's a very simple activity. You just take a certain amount of material. So in this case, three equal lengths of string, and you can make the three shapes and see how much honey or M&Ms you can fit inside. And you can see you can fit way more M&Ms in the hexagon than either of the other shapes. So it's something fun that you can play around with at home. So to understand how the bees figure it out, of course they don't have the ability to do all the math that I just walked through, we have to understand a little bit about how evolution happens. So, we can imagine a population of bees that are all the same and they reproduce, they make a lot of babies. And then maybe winter comes and they can't all survive and they grow up and there's a, the same number of adults as there was in the first generation. And every now and then, one of those babies is gonna be a little bit different in some way that might confer an advantage on it. So that orange individual is gonna to survive to become an adult. And if for some reason, that orange individual has an edge over all the black individuals, he's gonna have more offspring. So they're gonna be more orange individuals in the population until eventually um, it's all orange individuals. And that can happen repeatedly. So for a while, things are not gonna change. And then maybe a yellow bee shows up and eventually everyone is yellow. So we don't know the exact order of events in the history or the evolution of uh, bees or wasps. But something like this must have occurred. They started with one bad strategy, maybe moved on to a slightly better strategy, moved on to a slightly better strategy until eventually they reached hexagons. Um, things might have gone in a different order or they might have skipped some, some of those steps. But somehow, through an evolutionary process, these insects have figured out that hexagons are the best way to build their nests or their hives. And all sorts of different species have figured out the same solution and have continued to use it for a really long time. Um, I think a lot of the time when we think about adaptations in, in evolution, we think of really big, amazing things like a really long giraffe neck that lets it reach those acacia leaves, or a chameleon's ability to camouflage, or primates' opposable thumb that lets us grab stuff and use tools. But the hexagons, I think, are just as amazing an adaptation as all these other maybe more showy things. It's just amazing that these little insects have figured out through a process of mutation and natural selection, the same thing that it takes us a little bit of work with pencil and paper to do some math to figure out the same answer. It's just an amazing convergence. And bees and wasps are not the only ones that have figured out uh, that hexagons are the most efficient way to pack things. Hexagons can be found all throughout nature. So this is a radiolarian, it's an aquatic creature. Um, and again, you can see lots of hexagons in this beautiful, 
kind of shell structure. Um, this is a picture of a lichen I took here on our field station. It's a little bit hard to see, but there are all these little groups of lichen are kind of forming different territories, and there's one that makes a very nice hexagon on the left. This is a fish called a hexagon rock pod because a lot of its spots are hexagon shaped. Um, this is a picture of a coral, and there are a lot of hexagons in there too. And this is a picture of the fruiting bodies of a slime mold, and there are lots of hexagons in there too. So there are a lot of hexagons, but not only hexagons. And this is another part of that activity that we like to do on some of our field trips, which is just to take a few pictures and count the different shapes that we see. So again, I did this for a video um, on YouTube a couple weeks ago. I took these five pictures, which are on the upper left, a close-up of the eyeball of a krill, um, a box turtle, and I was looking at the shapes of its scoots or its, um, the plates on its shell. Um, the upper right-hand corner, is uh, the picture a picture of basalt that has cooled in all sorts of different um, polygons. The bottom left is the skin of a pineapple and then we have some water bubbles and you can just go through the pictures and count the different types of shapes that you can see and I did that um, and I found some quadrilaterals and some pentagons and some heptagons but far and away I found the most hexagons so I like to say that hexagons are nature's favorite shape and they're my favorite shape too. Um, and this would be a really fun thing to go out and do with kids, or I had a lot, a lot of fun doing it myself, just to go out and see how many different shapes you might be able to find in nature, and I expect that you'll find more hexagons than anything else. Um, and the reason that hexagons are in all these other places is the same, that it's the same reason as why they're in bee nests and hives, is because nature in general likes to find the solution that can minimize the energy or the tension required to construct something in hexagons are the shape to do that. Okay, so this is my, that's the end of the hexagon story, and this is my reminder to check in. So let me know if you have any questions, and I'll take questions before I move on to the next part of the talk. Any questions? Yeah, please use the chat just to minimize noise, but it looks like we don't, so I will check back in at the end. All right, okay, great. Okay, the next pattern I'm gonna talk about is a little bit more complicated, but I think that makes it even more satisfying to find out in nature. And it has to do with plants rather than with animals. And if you look at, this is the bottom, the picture of a bottom of a pine cone, let's see, I think, well, the bottom of a pine cone. And if you just look at it for a second, I hope you'll start to see some patterns there is a repeating pattern. The scales have similar shapes that go over and over, but what I'm really looking at is the fact that the scales on the pine cone seem to show up in lines that go around the pine cone. So I'll show you some. There are some lines that curve kind of down to the left. Here they are again. And if you count those lines, there are eight of them. And there are also lines that curve up and around to the right. And here they are in pink. And if you count those lines, there are 13 of them. So there are eight going one way and 13 going the other. So again, here is the unmodified picture. And I hope you can start to see the lines of the scales going around in the two kind of clockwise and counterclockwise ways. And here it is again. And this is a beautiful pine cone that has a nice flat bottom. You don't often find that, or at least I don't. Um, so usually if you're looking at pine cones, you have to kind of look at the whole 3D structure. So if you go out and do this yourself, which I hope you will, um, you, can, you have to start looking for the lines and the scales that actually work their way up the cone one way and then the other. And again, you'll find maybe eight and 13. And it's not just pine cones that have these lines. Um, this is a picture of an artichoke and it also has lines in its leaves um, that go counterclockwise and counterclockwise. So in this case, I found five lines going one way and eight lines going the other way. Um, this is a picture of an aster that um, Bert actually took here at the Clifton Institute a couple weeks ago, and this is kind of a twofer, which is extra special. You can see the lines in those inner flowers going the two ways, and you can also see that the flowers are kind of packed together like hexagons, which is just awesome. Um, but in this case, I found 
21 lines going one way and 34 lines going the other way. This is a picture of a sunflower where, again, you can see those curves. I'm hoping, I hope you start to get a feel for it and you can see 34 of them going one way and 55 of them going the other way. You'll have to take my word for it. And this is just a huge sunflower. Uh, and again, there are those lines. There are 89 of them going one way and 144 of them going the other way. So in all of these lines that we've counted in different pictures, we've seen only a small set of numbers. We've seen 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, and 144. That might seem like a random collection of numbers, but they're not. They're a subset of a sequence of numbers, which is called the Fibonacci numbers. And the way the sequence starts is with two ones, and the way you get the next number in the sequence is just to add up the two previous numbers. So one and one make two, one and two make three, two and three make five, and so on. And this is a really important, really famous sequence of numbers that shows up all over the place in mathematics. Um, and just to uh, summarize again what we found in all those different pictures, in the artichoke we found two consecutive Fibonacci numbers. We found five and eight numbers of curves going the two different ways. In the pine cone we found eight and 13. In the aster we found 21 and 34. In the sunflower we found 34 and 55. So again, consecutive numbers in the sequence, and then finally we found 89 and 144. Um, so the question is, why does this pattern show up? And it's not just in those pictures that I showed you, like you can see it in pine cones, you can see it in artichokes, asters, thistles, um, and this is just pictures of things that I've counted, and I'm sure there are other examples as well. Um, I found Fibonacci numbers in what's called bear corn or squaw root, which is one of those cool plants that parasitizes the roots of a tree um, and doesn't actually produce any chlorophyll of its own. Um, I have found them in pineapples in a plant called English plantain. Um, this is the pod of a tulip tree that we have so many of here in Virginia, so you can go and find one of these for sure. Um, this is the, the pod or the fruit of a magnolia tree. Um, this is the bud of a rhododendron, a strawberry. Um, this is a plant called thimbleweed. This is a palm tree. And this is a plant called Jack in the Pulpit. And there's an asterisk on it because I didn't strictly find Fibonacci numbers, but I found two consecutive um, numbers in a very closely related sequence called the Lucas numbers. But um, that's for another time. But in all of these pictures, in all of these very, very different plants, I have found Fibonacci numbers. And just like the bees, I think it's interesting to look at the evolutionary tree of plants. And in, whereas with the bees and the wasps, they were all organized in one group, Fibonacci numbers can be found all over this tree. So the strawberry is up top with the roses. The artichoke and the aster and the thistle are in the aster group. Um, the bear corn and the English plantain are in their own group. Rhododendron is in its own group. Um, the thimbleweed is in its own group. Pineapple, uh, I'm blocking myself with the speaker view. Um, the palm tree is in a different group. Um, the tulip tree and the magnolia are in the magnolia group. And then we have the pine cone down in the gymnosperms. So Fibonacci numbers are showing up all over with the evolutionary tree of plants. And the question is, why is that? And this is a little project that I've just started in the last couple of weeks. I've been counting Fibonacci numbers for a while now, just anytime I go for a walk and I find a pine cone and I count the numbers and see what I get, but I hadn't actually started recording any of the numbers that I was finding. So I'm starting a little project trying to record the Fibonacci numbers that I find in different species. Um, I'm interested in learning whether a species always produces the same two numbers or whether it changes from individual to individual. And I've already started to notice some interesting patterns. And this too would be something fun that you can do on a hike, um, just to start keeping track of the Fibonacci numbers that you find yourself. And I would love to know what you find. Um, but just like those bees and the wasps, um, plants have to use a lot of energy and a lot of resources to build the structures that they're using to store their seeds. Um, so in the top right is the cross section of a pine cone. So you can see all the seeds around the outside, but you can see there's kind of a central core or stock that it has to build to hold on to all those seeds. 
Um, same with the bear corn. It has to put, build a stock to put all those flowers around. And same with the strawberry. It has to invest a lot into this beautiful juicy red strawberry just to hold all its seeds on the outside. Um, and the plant shouldn't waste any of those materials or any of the energy that it needed to build these structures. Um, so the question is, what's the most efficient way to pack seeds in a cone or a fruit? Um, most of these plants, and I'm just showing a couple examples here on the left, grow by putting a seed down in one place, and then some portion of the circle around, they place a new seed. Um, and then they keep going and going. So for instance, maybe this plant places a new seed one third of the way around the circle every time. So now it's put down two new seeds. And when it goes to put its third new seed, it's exactly overlapping where the first seed was. So it's gonna to have to go in a new layer or kind of build up into the pine cone or the, or the pineapple or outwards into the sunflower. And that's because of course, one third of a circle times three means one full circle. So we're exactly overlapping where we put our very first seed. Um, and if you continue that way, you can see that you'll just end up with three lines of seeds. And what I'm showing here is you should be imagining it as in the picture in the top left, kind of the bottom of a pine cone, but of course really it's a 3D structure. So you can imagine a really silly looking pine, pine cone that just has three separated lines of seeds going up the side. And that would just be a huge waste of material. It's gonna have to build this whole tall stock just to store a few lines of seeds around the sides. So the parameter that the plants can play around with is how they're gonna space their new seeds as they're growing. So let's try a different angle. So maybe each new seed is gonna be placed four sevenths, why not? Four sevenths of the circle around. So a second new seed goes four sevenths away, and then another new seed four sevenths away, and so on and so forth, until our seventh new seed exactly overlaps the first seed that we put down, because again, four sevenths of the circle times seven new seeds means that you've gone around the circle four times exactly. So that seventh seed is gonna be in exactly the same place as the first seed, so it's gonna have to get bumped up and start adding new layers to the pine cone or whatever kind of plant we're talking about. So again, we're gonna end up with these kind of separate lines of seeds and making a very weird looking pine, uh, pine cone or pineapple that doesn't look anything like what we actually see in nature. So I've tried two fractions, but you can see pretty quickly that any fraction of the circle that you use, so for instance, A over B of the circle, once you've put down exactly B new seeds, you're gonna have gone around A times, and you're gonna to start to overlap previous seeds exactly, and you're gonna be wasting a lot of space. So fractions of the circle are not a good way to place your new seeds. And it turns out that there are numbers that cannot be written as fractions. So I think this is one of the deep mathematical ideas of the talk. It is kind of blows your mind that there are numbers that cannot possibly be written as a ratio of one whole number to another. And these are called irrational numbers. So the square root of two is famously one of these irrational numbers. It's 1.4152135, but then if I kept reading the decimal points, I would go on forever. And again, there are no two whole numbers such that you can write the square root of two as the ratio of those two, two numbers. So what if we use this irrational number, the square root of two, to place our seeds? So what we're gonna do is instead of going a third of the way around the circle, we're gonna go the square root of two times around the circle, which is 509 degrees. But since that's more than all the way around, we can subtract 360 and get 149.1169 dot, 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 dot degrees. So this is what that's gonna look like. Again, we're going square root of two times around the circle. We have one seed, we have another, 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 another. It's filling up. And then when we put our 12th new seed, it doesn't exactly overlap with any of the previous seeds, but it doesn't exactly fit in either. So it also has to get bumped to a new layer and we can keep going that way. And then we get something that looks like this. So it looks pretty different than those rays of seeds I was showing you before. 
Um, things are filling up space a little bit better. Um, things are starting to curve and kind of fill out the whole pine cone. But there are still a lot of gaps, and you can see these nice, tidy lines going around with lots of space in between. So the square root of 2 is better, but still not great. And that's because the square root of 2 is very close to 17 twelfths. So it's very close to a fraction, so that once we've gone 12 times around the circle, we're almost at exactly 17 times around the circle. So that new seed doesn't exactly overlap the first seed, but it, there's a lot of overlap. And we end up with 12 spaced out lines of seeds that go around our kind of hypothetical pine cone. So we need something better. And to figure out what to do, we have to learn a little bit more about the number line, which we can picture like this, um, going off to negative infinity to the left and positive infinity to the right. And there are whole numbers in there. And there are also lots of fractions, every half, every third, every fourth, so on and so forth, which I'll show in red. And like I said, there are all sorts of numbers that cannot be written as fractions. And I'll show those here in yellow. Um, and the square root of 2 is there. It's about 1.4. And you can see that it's in kind of a red neighborhood of the number line. There are a lot of fractions nearby. So you can really get close approximations to the square root of 2. So it's very close to 17 twelfths. It's very close to 41 29ths. It's very close to 99 seventieths. So you can keep getting closer and closer approximations by using bigger denominators. But whatever you do, you're going to have a fraction very close to the square root of 2. And again, that's why we ended up with a lot of empty space in this pine cone, because the square root of 2 is very close to 17 twelfths. So what we should look for in our number line is not a number that's in a very rational or fraction heavy neighborhood. We should look for a number that's in a very yellow or very irrational neighborhood. And there's one right here at about 1.6 that's called phi, otherwise known as the golden ratio. And the golden ratio is that ratio such that if you take a line and divide it into two parts, a greater and a lesser, and the ratio of the whole line to the larger part is the same as the ratio of the larger part to the smaller part. That's called the golden ratio, also denoted by phi. And it's equal to 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2, which is equal to 1.618033398, blah, 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 until infinity. And of all the irrational numbers, of all the infinitely many irrational numbers, you can show that phi is the furthest from any other fractions, from any fractions. Um, in other words, phi is the most irrational number of all. So again, this is one of the fun mathematical facts of this talk, that you can actually show which is the most irrational number of all. So what if we use phi to place our seeds around our, our structures? So just like the square root of 2, we can place new seeds at phi times around the circle, um, which is 582.4922 degrees. And again, you can just subtract 360 degrees from that because that's having gone around the circle one time. So we're going to place new seeds successfully around the circle at 222.4922 degrees. So this is what that's going to look like. Again, we have our initial seed. We're going to put another seed and another and another and another. And I hope you'll start to get the sense that Using this angle has this almost uncanny magical ability to fill in all of the gaps. So any place where there's a gap in the seeds, this angle somehow seems to be able to find those places. So there's a gap that got filled in, and another, and another, and another, and all the gaps get filled in. And in this case, we managed to fit 13 seeds around our first layer, and then we're out of space. So our next seed has to go on another layer up. And you can see that it, again, really fits in a gap there and doesn't overlap with any of the previous seeds. And we can keep going around, filling in all the gaps. And if you keep going and going and going, you end up with something look, that looks like this. And this is the best that we've seen yet. There is some black space, there is some gaps in there, but really it does a nice job, using this angle does a nice job putting seeds everywhere and kind of filling the space as efficiently as possible. And you can explicitly compare 
the performance of the two irrational numbers that we've considered so far. So this is um, using the square root of two on the left and using phi on the right, and everything else is the same between these two pictures. It's the same size seeds, and it's the same number of seeds. So you can see just, use, just by eyeballing it that there's a lot more empty space on the left than there is on the right. And you can also see just how much more space the circle or the pine cone on the left takes up than the one on the right. And again, the, there's the exact same number of seeds in these two pine cones. The one on the left just takes up so much more space because they're not packed in efficiently. And we can play around with making the seeds different sizes. So again, square root of two on the left, phi on the right, and the same thing. There is so much more empty space on the left than on the right, and it just takes up a more amount of space. So that's more packing material the plants will have to build. We can use different size seeds, and always the square root of two is gonna take up more space, waste more space than using phi. One more, just because I love making all these cool patterns. Um, so by understanding a little bit about number theory, you can show that the golden ratio is the best angle to use because the plant can pack its seeds using the least amount of packing material, whatever that is for the different types of plants. So that's what the plants should be using, but are they? So the first piece of evidence that the plants are actually using it is that in these simulations that I've shown, when we use phi, I think you get the most realistic looking structures. So this to me looks quite a bit like those, that pine cone up in the top left. You can make, again, more seeds, different size. You can kind of play around with the model, but still you get something that looks quite a bit like a pine cone. Or you can make fat yellow seeds that look kind of like that pineapple. Or you can make really skinny orange seeds that look like that um, Cosmo or whatever it is. Um, but always the seeds are gonna be packed in efficiently and they start to look like actual natural objects. But the other piece of evidence is back from those Fibonacci numbers that we talked before. So this again is that pine, uh, pine cone that had eight and 13 seeds. And you can show using these simulating pine cones that if you use phi as an angle to place your new seeds, you'll start to see the same lines of seeds in this uh, picture as you do in real pine cones. And if you count them, in this example, you can find three of them going clockwise and five of them going counterclockwise. You can make skinnier seeds. And in this case, you find five curves going one way and eight curves going the other way. So we're finding Fibonacci numbers in our simulated pine cones. And they make even more. With smaller seeds, you get maybe eight and 13 lines, 13 and 21. I had a little fun making these crazy psychedelic patterns. You can get 21 going one way, 34 going the other. 34 and 55, and even 55 and 89. You don't get Fibonacci numbers if you use other angles. So if you use the square root of two, you don't get Fibonacci numbers, you get five and seven, and seven is not a Fibonacci number. Um, and just as a side note, this is uh, all the, what I've been showing you so far is pictures that I made with the computer program, but you can do this by hand. Um, Vyheart.com is an excellent resource for all sorts of mathematical videos for kids. Um, and she has this activity, which I love doing myself and also with kids, is to make what she calls an angle charm, um, this little kind of Pac-Man shaped with a V-shaped angle cut out of it. And you can use that to actually draw um, your own pine cones or sunflowers. And these are some pictures of uh, pictures that some students at Fokker High made when I took this activity to them last fall. So that's a fun thing to check out. Um, so to summarize where we are so far, if we use phi, so if we place new angles at phi times around the circle, that's the best possible angle to use. And we can tell that's what the plants are actually using because we see Fibonacci numbers in their curves. So through the same evolutionary process that helped the bees figure out to use hexagons, the plants have figured out through a blind process of mutation and natural selection to use the golden ratio when they're growing which is just amazing that it took quite a bit of mathematics um, that it takes, it took a long time for people to figure out all the mathematics underlying the golden ratio. And these plants without any brains, without any of that mathematical knowledge, were able to figure out the same answer to a, a pretty difficult mathematical process, um, which is just amazing. And again, they are all over the evolutionary tree. 
And I have a little bone to pick with um, the kind of popular understanding of Fibonacci numbers. I made this about a year ago. I just Googled Fibonacci, or rather the, the golden ratio in nature, and I got all these images. And a lot of them are spirals, which I have a bone to pick with for separate reasons. A lot of them are sunflowers or asters. A lot of them are pine cones. And a lot of them are succulents. And that pretty much takes up all the pictures I could see. So the vast majority of the pictures in that Google search were either spirals, sunflowers, asters, pine cones, or succulents. And it's missing all of these other plants that I have myself have found Fibonacci numbers in. And for some reason, people don't seem that interested in finding Fibonacci numbers in the vast diversity of species where I think they can be found. Um, so like I said, I'm working on this project to try to find them in as many species as I can. And I would love for you to help me. Um, please let me know if you find them in any interesting species. Um, so just to wrap up, um, animals and plants are under evolutionary pressure to store their eggs or seeds, pretty much the same thing, um, as efficiently as possible. So for wasps and bees, they have figured out through evolutionary time to use hexagons because they require the least amount of material. And plants who are storing their seeds in cones or fruits have figured out, again, through evolutionary time, that the golden ratio requires the least amount of material to store their seeds. So it's just amazing that all these different species have found these mathematical solutions through the process of natural selection. And I think it's fun just to see uh, instances of really pure mathematics out in the world. Um, but I think it's really amazing to study these two patterns in particular because by observing and explaining these patterns, it helps us understand and learn quite a bit about what the plants and the animals are evolving to do. And it just shows how amazing evolution can be and the, the kind of problems that it can solve. Um, I like to end a lot of my talks with a reading list. I'm actually kind of disappointed on the literature and this topic. Um, I've browsed through a number of books and haven't found any that I really love on these two patterns in particular, um, but this is a classic um, that doesn't do talk a lot about these patterns, but it talks a lot about lots of other ways that mathematics and physics can help you understand um, the forms that are out there in nature. And I would love to know if you have a, a different recommendation. Um, and I would also love if you went out and did some of these activities for yourself, and I would love to see what you find. Um, so I would be happy to take any questions. Let's see if I can get back to the chat. Here we go. Um, So someone says, if you place a lot of egg yolks into a container, they squish to a hexagon, which is a great observation. Um, I think the bees have learned, quote unquote, learned to use hexagons um, through natural selection. But a lot of these other things like water bubbles, maybe the shells on the turtle shells, that's not through natural selection. It is just the fact that when you smush round things together, they often form hexagons. Because physics, just like evolution, has a way of kind of finding the minimum um, surface area or tension required to store them and stuff. So it's kind of a cool convergence between an evolutionary process and a physical process. Um, Catherine asked, is there anything known about the gene expression underlying the hexagon patterns? No, I don't believe so. And part of the problem, I think, is that as far as I know, any bees or wasps that make um, structures to store their, their eggs or their honey use hexagons. So there isn't kind of a, an out group to compare, well, this group use hex, uses hexagons and that group uses triangles, so we could try to figure out what gene makes those two different patterns, because pretty much everything uses hexagons. Um, and as, as common as they are, I think we're still kind of in the dark about how these hexagons are actually formed in, in the beehives. Um, Catherine also asked, does every plant use the golden ratio or just more evolved ones? In other words, might some older plants on the evolutionary tree use the square root of two? Also a great question. Um, I think we often use the word older or kind of ancestral plants on an evolutionary tree, but the fact is that all plants have had their separate evolutionary histories for the same amount of time. So in some sense, all all life has been evolving for however many billions it's year, it's billions of years it's been since life first evolved. So we do sometimes use the term ancestral or older lineage in, in evolutionary biology, but it, it does give the misconception that they're kind of stuck in some ancestral state, whereas everything else has been evolving away from them. Um, and I think over time, 
pretty much all of the lineages of the plants have had time now to uh, converge on the golden ratio rather than other angles. Um, I have found species where I haven't been able to find Fibonacci numbers. One of them was um, a milkweed pod. If you um, ever kind of peel away the, the wrapping of a milkweed pod, the seeds in there are, are lined up. And I just had a hard time even counting the numbers. The structure was so different than what I was used to. So I think there are, there are counter examples and I would love to, to know if you find one too. Um, Emily asked, what about the value of what comes in the spaces, i.e. the juicy part of strawberries? Also a great question. Yeah, strawberries is maybe a funny example because of course, yeah, all that juicy stuff has a, has a function of attracting the squirrel or the raccoon or whoever it is that's going to eat that nice juicy fruit. Um, but at least in pine cones or, you know, in a sunflower, the kind of the base structure that's holding all those seeds in there I can't think of much purpose that it's using. So I think it's cool that even in a structure like a strawberry where you can visualize the function of the, the, the kind of packing material, even there, there's such a, a, such a strong pressure to pack seeds inefficiently that they also use Fibonacci numbers. Um, also, did the fossil magnolia have the same ratio? That's a great question. I haven't looked at any fossils. I just came back from um, North Carolina a couple weeks ago and I was looking down there at cucumber magnolias and Fraser magnolias. And I found a lot of cones from those two species and they had, let's see if I can find in my notes because I don't remember. Um, the Fraser magnolia had eight and 13 and the cucumber magnolia had five and eight. So all these different extant species of magnolia seem to have different numbers. And I, yeah, that's a great idea. I should look at some, some fossils. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming. That was really fun for me. Um, I'll stick around and answer a couple more questions, but please feel free to kind of tune out um, if you don't have any more questions. Thank you for coming, and I hope we will see you out here sometime soon. Okay, Dr. Jacob says, because the Fibonacci number requires an increasing number due to larger size, does this, does this in turn limit the number of seeds that the head of a, uh, the sunflower will produce? And I think, yeah, I think to answer that question, it's a, my, my pictures are a little bit misleading. So for instance, in this one, it looks like the seeds are getting, uh, not this one rather, it looks like the seeds are getting bigger as you go out. Um, and that's kind of an artifact of this simulation because again, you should really be thinking about this as a pine cone growing up. So they're the same fraction of, of the angle up top as in the interior just takes up more space because the circle is bigger up there. Um, but it is, a, a, the, the, the relative size of seeds at different levels in a structure is something I'm, I'm interested in. Um, learning more about. All right. Thank you, everyone.